But we have a very exciting show for you. Welcome to Meet the Expert with Elliot Callen. If you need to reach us, it's 925-314-8503 or www.prosperityfinancialgroup.com. But today, this show is designed for entrepreneurs, want to be entrepreneurs, or people that you know that you're connected to that are entrepreneurs, because we're going to talk with one of the most successful small business entrepreneurs in the United States. And he's in an industry that nobody really thinks about, and that's sports facility facilities. We're going to talk with, about how they think about putting sports facilities in, baseball, football fields, pickleball, tennis, ice hockey, soccer, whatever it is, and how they remunerate and they monetize this to become tens of millions of dollars every single year in a multi-billion dollar business. How kids thrive, and actually, we're going to talk a little bit about the downside of this, how kids don't thrive, and they don't do well, or they make the last out of the game, or they're not the kind of kids that play in these big sports facilities. So we're going to connect that of how a Brighter Day charity that we run at a brighterday.info coordinates with teens that they're not thriving in this, but boy, do they have to have a place in society. So I hope you enjoy the show. Very exciting what you're about to hear. Well, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. I'm Elliot Callen, CEO of Prosperity Financial Group. I am so excited for this Meet the Expert program. Totally another track to go by just to keep you shaking in your boots and looking for new, new ideas out in the marketplace. So today we're meeting with Jason Clement. Jason is CEO of Sports Facility Companies out of the East Coast. Um, basically what they do, everyone, is they build sports facilities for kids, for adults, for teens, whatever that might be. And so you might say, why are we interviewing him? What does that have to do with the financial planning world that we're in? And we're doing that because we're bringing to you a business owner. So many of our, so many of our clients own companies and look to other entrepreneurs for ideas. And today is that, that opportunity to look to what Jason has done, how he's done it. Finding a niche in a market is definitely a niche-oriented thing. Uh, most of us think of sports facilities as being built by the town or buying developer or somebody like that. But now we're going to hear a different story on that and how it works. So uh, let me welcome you, Jason. Welcome to Meet the Expert with Elliot Callen. Elliot, great to be with you. Thanks for having me. And congratulations on the platform that's been built here. It's a real honor to be to be on with you. Great. Glad to have you. And if you're a business owner or you know a business owner in your family that likes hearing about from entrepreneurs, give us a call at 925-314-8503. Whether you're looking to build your business or sell your business or enter the different phases of business, which is maybe from startup all the way to sale, uh, let's have that conversation. Because usually if you don't have a plan in place, then nature's going to give you a plan whether you like it or not. And, you know, giving the government half the money or handing it down to your kids that want nothing to do with your business and, and probably wouldn't meet your expectations, that's not a good estate plan. And so we're going to, we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, so the phone number is 925-314-8503. The website is prosperityfinancialgroup.com. And the email is Elliot, E-L-L-I-O-T, at prosperityfinancialgroup.com. And if we don't, no question is too simple and no question is too complicated, we'll get you an answer. So, Jason, I want to talk a little bit about what you do. In a nutshell here, what do you do? Well, we help uh, people strategically plan, um, finance, fund, uh, develop, and then manage youth and amateur sports complexes, sports and entertainment uh, complexes. Okay, so my thinking is obviously wrong that I think towns build this. The city of Fremont, the city of San Jose, the city where you are of Tampa, Florida, they don't, they don't need you. All they need you to do is the construction because they're going to bid it out, get get the lowest bid anyway for three fields, what they think they need. So why do they need you? What do you do? Hey, look, uh, government is good at, at a number of things, um, but uh, you know, managing and optimizing these assets um, isn't necessarily one of them. I'm not saying they're all bad, um, but you know, like a lot of industries, uh, you know, we found our niche in helping them optimize the results that they're looking to accomplish, whether it's a municipal government. We have um, private mixed use developments uh, as well. And uh, in today's economy, private public partnerships are really the future. Uh, a lot of these mixed use developers are looking for incentives from municipalities, and um, they're using these youth and amateur sports complexes to be the anchor tenant, if you will, the draw that catalyzes um, the rest of the development that brings, you know, the hundreds of thousands of, of visitors 
uh, to the the community, and they can then utilize for the rest of their their development. Okay, so we're talking about soccer, obviously the 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 number one sport out there for youth. Football, baseball. Yep, yep. So when we look at these complexes, we want to design and develop flexible spaces. So. You know, a soccer field can double as a football field and a rugby field. Lacrosse is big. And then you can go, you know, crossways and really maximize the amount of kids and families that are on there. Uh, A lot of band and performing arts competitions as well. We run concerts and different types of events on that type of field. Then you've got your diamond sports um, for, you know, baseball, softball and others. Uh, Cricket uh, is coming online uh, more and more. You know, World Cup of Cricket just uh, just finished here in in, uh, New York City. Um, and then on the indoor side, uh, you know, courts, basketball, volleyball, futsal, and uh, a number of others. Pickleball's, you know, blowing up. And then we have non-sport activities uh, over the indoor trade shows, conferences. Um, really what these are are convention centers, uh, many convention centers that um, you utilize with flexible programming to drive as many people in and serve as many as possible. So is that basketball and ice hockey? Uh, we do ice. Yep, we do have ice. We have aquatics, seasonal aquatic centers. Um, and then as part of this, amphitheaters, um, RV parks, uh, we've got zip lines, ropes courses, and a number of other amenities that, you know, come online. Uh, you know, our vision um, is to develop and manage the highest performing venues in the country. And our mantra is to serve more and serve better in terms of the operational opportunities. And uh, we want families uh, coming away from this feeling really good about the experience they just had, you know, in these complexes. Okay. so. Before I get to the money side of this, because that's, that's a money show, so how many people roughly in a year, and a month, and a quarter are visiting these sports facilities? That's question number one. Number two, and are you maintaining control slash management ownership of these so you can get paid on them? And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Yeah, we do. So, um, you know, we, we get a management fee, um, five and 10 year management agreements to manage these complexes. Uh, it's generally a blend of a fixed fee plus incentive based on whatever the goals of that venue owner um, might be. We rarely take an ownership stake. It's just not the way we've decided to grow. Um, we've been able to um, um, utilize our resources and grow faster um, by being an outsourced management provider. Um, you know, outsourced or um, privatized is the way that we we look at it, um, and that's how we're compensated. And um, we've got in the venues that um, we're affiliated with or managed, um, we've got you know $500 million in visitor spending um, that's happening annually. And we've got about 40 million guest visits um, that are happening in these communities that you know we're blessed to be a part of. Well, let me say that back to you so I make sure I understood it, Jason. We're talking to Jason Clement of uh, Sports Facilities Corporation that builds for- sports facilities and manages them, not owns them, but manages them all around the United States. They're based in Florida. 40 million people, adults, children, doesn't matter, are visiting the facilities that you manage across the country. Is that right? That's right. Wow. And that generates into what kind of revenue for you? Yeah, yeah. So um, it depends on, you know, the venue and whatnot, but um, it's about $200 million uh, in revenue across the venues that, you know, we have a hand in. Um, and that revenue is generated from league, camp, clinic, tournaments, events, food and beverage, you know, sponsorship and marketing partnerships, um, all of those types of services that um, we are managing and delivering on behalf of our clients and owners of these venues. And then how many employees does it take to manage all these facilities? Well, we started in 2003, so just over 20 years ago uh, with three of us, and we're now at 3,300. We just eclipsed. Yeah, you have to be local on the ground. You can't be managing, you know, Atlanta from Tampa. It just doesn't work on that. You got to have somebody there. Eyes. Eyes on the ground in sports is so important. Now, for somebody who's played sports his whole life and for children who played comp- really competitive sports when they were growing up, there were people that we knew that were at holes on a soccer field that broke their ankle. Um, there were chips in the ice where people hurt their knee. You don't want that. That's all bad stuff. You know, it's interesting is that, you know, there are a number of new developments that are coming online that, you know, we've got architects, we've got engineers, we've got, um, you know, developers on our team and on our staff. 
Um, but there are just as many. And when you look at, you know, the interest rates and the cost of construction and what's happened over the last few years, there are just as many existing complexes that are not in pristine. That's uh, the kind way of saying what you just shared, not in pristine condition um, that can just be upgraded a little bit and be a great destination for a number of events. Again, Lead Camp Clinic and provide an even better service. And and I don't know of a community not looking at their recreation assets right now saying, how can we either um, spruce these up to provide a better service and take advantage of this economy, which is the travel sports economy that's happening um, you know, right now, $14 billion industry that, that that's happening a, across the country, um, or saying, how can we add to it and build new? So it's a little, it's a combination of, of how do we renovate existing? How do we build new so that we can maximize our destination to, uh, you know, take our piece of the sports tourism pie? So all these great sports programs, and I want to shift gears with you for a moment. All these great sports facilities are, are increasing the amount of sports programs that we have out there, correct? Yep. Which increases the amount of youth involvement. Let's talk about youth and skip the adults for a moment, but the youth involvement, uh, correct? And you're getting a piece in a, of every little one of these things. That is that how this works? Yeah. So we're we you know we're managing those that those venues, and when you look at the the economy of the of the sports experience right now, um, it's it's certainly you know registration and you know for players to play and whatever activity that they they're in. But the retail is a big component of this. When I talk about sports tourism, the travel. Um, that, that comes in with it, the lodging that, that is associated with it, the spend in a market for food and beverage uh, that comes alongside of it. Uh, there's just so many pieces to it right now. And then we're looking at the technology as well, um, you know, relative to uh, sports facility management models. And then, you know, things like um, NBC Sports Engine um, or and I guess it's NBC Next now. They just rebranded um, Dick Sporting Goods owns. Um, Game Changer, which is an app to track what's what's playing. And, you know, these retail shops or media um, destinations are just getting more and more involved. And uh, I know this isn't, you know, just a, a sports podcast, but it's a business podcast. Um, there is a lot of private equity and private capital coming into this marketplace right now because it's just exploding. And if any of the, um, you know, previous downturns that have taken place over the last couple of decades uh, you know, in our economy are any indication, youth sports and travel sports are recession proof, recession resistant, um, because a lot of families will cut a lot of things before they cut their kids and family experiences relative to sports, because it is really important. It's really important to character development. It's really important from an entertainment perspective. Um, it's, it's important. Kids love to play. It's good for physical literacy and ongoing health. All of these things are, you know, positive attributes to your point on the sports experience. And so when you look at the economy and you look at, you know, what's happening, um, there's just a, a, a flood of equity capital um, coming into this marketplace right now, um, you know, which does change the landscape. So we're talking really with Jason Clement here. We're talking about sports facilities and we it sounds, Jason, like you're in phase two of your business. You're well past the startup phase. And you are in absolute growth and maximizing your own personal cash flow and the owner's cash flow from this. But you've not entered phase three, which is I'm going to sell this company one day. Uh, you're still in the middle of it. You're too young to maybe do that. Or you're just too enjoying it too much to do it. Or it's just too profitable to walk away from this cash cow. And this is what business owners go through. We try to help them with that. Because if I was talking to you, Jason, and you were my client, I'd be saying in phase two, tell me what phase three looks like. Tell me how that it transitions to the next generation, to a new company, badges, and, and then what are you going to do with that money in retirement? Because watching TV is not a good alternative in your retirement. Good choice. But we're not going to do that. because, And that's why I tell business owners, what you can learn from Jason is phase two, and he's obviously very successful, wildly successful in what he does. You can learn from that because there's going to come a point that Jason will be in diminishing returns for his time, effort, and that's the time to step aside and make room for the young people and enjoy your retirement. And he's in Florida. There are a million things to do in Florida, but it doesn't matter. It's just, you could do that. So let me talk for a moment, Jason, I, and as I want to talk about the economic vitality that your firm touches within a local community. Because if I'm correct, you're here in California, in Fremont and Santa Clara locally right here. And I, years ago, 
when my kids were playing sports, uh, hockey, particularly my boys played hockey, the Sharks were talking about opening up a practice facility closer to where we live because we weren't near anything. And they talked to Concord, they talked to Walnut Creek. These are local towns to where we are in San Ramon, California, out in the East Bay of, of San Francisco. And they all, every town in San Ramon, they all turned them down, saying there's not enough money on sales tax to be made on ice hockey. And that's all they saw as profitability. And maybe, maybe that's all the Sharks presented as being profitable. So how do you present this as changing economic vitality? And what are the realities of that, too? Yeah, ice. Look, ice is tough. It's a good example to share. Ice is tough because you can only get so many kids, you know, on a sheet at a time. And then secondly, uh, depending on the footprint, and and that's the issue there in Northern California. Same in Southern California. You know, we're developing uh, in partnership with the City of Ontario an extraordinary complex. I, I mean, it's going to be first class. Um, but but real estate is so expensive in those particular areas. And when you start looking at highest and best use um, for a municipality um, to develop one of these, it, it can't just be about sales tax produced by that venue. It has to be what is it producing in and around, you know, the entire community. ICE is tough because um, two sheets takes up a pretty big footprint. Um, it's expensive to operate, uh, although as somebody who probably spent a lot of money on ICE time, um, you can make those venues um profitable in and of themselves. Um, but in terms of bringing in tournament and outside um, players, one sheet, two sheets um, is a really tough thing to, to look at because you can't get as many teams to travel in over, you know, just two playing surfaces. The difference in, you know, call it a basketball court then or a volleyball court even, you know, which is even smaller. In that same footprint, you can get a bunch of volleyball courts down, which brings in a whole bunch of different teams. Um, and, a, and a larger volume of folks that are going to spend money in hotels and drive up the hotel tax up. They're going to spend money in, in food and beverage and restaurants. And then it's going to spur a quality of life as well that, you know, increases property um, tax as well. So those are the, you know, three or four ways we look at it from a municipal standpoint. And even then, I would share with you in California specifically, Southern California, Northern California, it's still really tough because, you know, the, the real estate is so expensive there. Um, and you know, you need to be able to justify it with that ancillary development, mixed use development, in addition to the economic growth that's going to come as a result of it. You know, there's a, there's a growing plethora of high end exercise clubs, Jason, here in California and life fitness, Bay club, two major examples, club sports, no Bay club. What are you connected with any of these and is it these are all solo facilities, but they have 30 of them or 50 of them. Some have a golf course. Um, and there's a real question of whether these are profitable or are they just going through bodies. Uh, so am I affiliated with them? None that you mentioned, um, but we we have been and are with, you know, some others. You know, one, one example um, that, that comes to mind, um, they grew to the 18th largest um, health and fitness um, club in the country, which 18th doesn't sound that large, you know, when you look at, at it in and of itself, but, you know, it's 15. Um, they had locations down. They had 15 locations, some down in Florida here, some up in, in Michigan as well. And what we look at is for that to be an amenity attached to some of these developments that we're working on. So, um, you know, we're, we're um, opening up this fall uh, in Overland Park, Kansas a large mixed use development that's going to have a fitness component like that with it, two sheets of ice that, you know, you just mentioned. It's going to have um, eight basketball courts with it as well. Attached to it is going to be a pickleball slash top golf meets, you know, pop stroke, miniature golf sort of entertainment area. And then there's a family entertainment center component. So imagine Dave and Buster's in, in it as well. So that's the next generation of these um, type of developments here. So Blue Hawk development in Overland Park, um, it's extraordinary. Um, but this kind of combination of sport, entertainment, food and beverage and eating, and all of those things is really the future um, of, of what's coming here. And it's, it's pretty interesting and exciting. And that's the type of thing that spurs significant development, you know, in and around. And when you combine that fitness, which is from a business perspective, it's like an annuity. It's an ongoing membership role, month over month, that just continues to generate revenue. 
whereas um, some of these other pieces, league camp clinic, tournament events, um, and social, um, you know, birthday parties and those sorts of things that happen, um, they can be a little seasonal and a little cyclical. So um, it's nice to have that fitness component as a baseline revenue stream, if that makes sense to you. It does. And I want to talk about the other side of sports with kids for just a moment before we call it a day here. And that is that not every kid plays sports. Lots of them don't. And then some of the kids who do play sports get blown out by a bad coach or they're the last one to end the baseball game with a strikeout or drop the ball or whatever they did. Or It's a depressing, sad moment. And so the we know sports to be a really positive alternative for kids, but it also can, it has the ugly side to it. It just does where they go home and they are lower than low. And, you know, I always tell everybody, my, my, my brother and I played a massive amount of sports growing up. It was a little bit different then because travel wasn't really part of it. There was enough in our league. And we played ice hockey and we played football, lots of football. I don't think I played enough football in my life. And I was sure that I was going to be the next Joe Namath of the New York Jets from all my football days. And if I just had six more inches and a stronger arm, I know I could have done it. All right. But my mother understood something, or my, particularly my mother, because she was reading us all the time. And so if we had a great game, maybe we got that hit to win the game, threw a touchdown, ran for a touchdown, scored a goal, whatever that was. Her way of rewarding us was to take us to White Castle. If, you're, if you don't know what White Castle is, it's the home of the original sliders, those listening. It's just a treat. If you're from the East Coast, it's a treat. If you're not, it's not the same thing as the frozen ones in your supermarket. So don't think of them as White Castle. It's, it's like buying a burger and saying, oh, this tastes like a quarter pounder cheese. You might love the quarter pounder cheese or hate it, but going to buy a frozen burger cookie, it is not the same thing. So my mother would take us to White Castle, and these were eight cents a burger in those days. I'm dating myself into Jersey, but so for $2, we could get basically unlimited amount of burgers. We weren't going to finish for $2 worth. And we each got a small orange drink and went with it, which is kind of like a Tang, if you remember what Tang was, uh, the old-fashioned product. And by the end of that, we felt pretty good and pretty connected that no matter what happened on the ball field, we were kind of grounded and we can go on with the night. But you, you don't grow from that. You grow more from losing, sadly, and, and striking out to end the game and dropping the ball to end the game and... And even their kids, some their friends sometimes ripping on you because you, you blew it. You're the reason we lost, which is terrible. But, you know, kids do this to each other. And I, we'd come home totally depressed, sad, not depressed in the clinical sense, but depressed like you just feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders and you're a bad person because you, you lost the game for your team. And we know as adults that's not true, but as kids, it's a different thing. And my mother would take us to White Castle and for $2 – She'd do the same thing she did as if we won the game. At the end of that White Castle session, there was no winning and winner to losing world. We were all in a pretty good place. And I see that today not happening. Um, I'm going to give my mom credit who's gone already 26 years. I see it not happening because the pressure of sports is so great. And the pressure on the parents. We got yelled at when my I think my, my son was in 10th or 11th grade. And a mother was yelling at the other mom saying, with her point, finger pointed, you don't understand, my son is going to play for the New York Rangers. And of course, by the time he was 16, he was already out of sports because she killed it. Um, but we see that a lot. And I'm concerned because I run a charity foundation called A Brighter Day at abrighterday.info that deals with teenage stress and depression. I wrote a book all about it called Driven by Elliot Callen. And I'm concerned that as good as we do with sports, we may be inflicting just as much pain to either those that don't play it, those that don't keep up, those that aren't good enough to play in travel sports, or those that simply and unfortunately end the game with their mistake. What do you think of that? Yeah, no, look, you're 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 right. Um, there is a um, a study done that asks kids, "Hey, what are your favorite parts of the game? What are your least favorite parts of the game?" And the number one answer to least favorite part of the game is the car ride home, number one. And that's because parents are getting on kids, right, about their game. It's their chance to jaw, like, hey, I saw you do this, right? I saw you do that. And I've remembered that, you know, with my kids personally, and to your mom's credit, um, she made the after the game part White Castle, right? Make it ice cream, make it whatever for these kids. 
look, they're going to grow up and get to the competitive um, side of it soon enough. Um, but you're you're exactly right. You spurned another thought as well. You know, while you were while you were talking there, um, we're talking about the kids that get to play, right? And we're talking about right now in this conversation um, how we coach them so they can get the most out of their um, opportunity. And oh, by the way, you are going to lose. That's life. You are going to make an error. That's going to happen. You are going to strike out, right? Uh, things are going to happen. You're going to miss a shot, and you may miss a game winning shot or game losing shot. And how you deal with that adversity. Um, that's the lesson, and it's the great lesson that that sports, you know, provides here. Um, you know, we have a conference room here that we named. We named all our conference rooms after different coaches, um, and one of them is John Wooden, the John Wooden Conference Room um, for us. So you're on the West Coast, right? You can appreciate that a little bit. And so we have what <laughs> we have what we call Wooden Wednesday, and we send out an email about something that John Wooden said every Wednesday. So yesterday's email was care more about um, your, your character than your reputation. And what he talks about when he says that, and I'll make this really brief, is that as a player, as a business person, um, you're, you're going to at times, you know, get arrows slung at you. You are. And sometimes you deserve it. You made a mistake. Sometimes you don't deserve it. Um, but don't care about the reputation in terms of what people are saying, especially if you're winning in business, right? If you're the lead dog, you got the bullseye on your back. You are going to get this stuff sling at, slung at you. Then he says, look, there are also going to be days when you get praised. Sometimes you deserve it. Sometimes you don't. But don't pay too much attention to it. Don't pay too much about to, attention to what people care about on the low side or the high side. But really pay attention to your character and the decisions make, you're making along the way. And that's what sports has the opportunity, if coached well, if parented well, to help build in these kids as, as they continue to grow. Last piece on this, as, as I mentioned, we're talking about the kids that get to play. There are a bunch of kids left behind right now that aren't getting this experience, positive or negative, because they can't afford to play. I mean, we just talked about the private equity, the cost to develop these complexes. It's expensive to travel and get to do all of these things. And there are a lot of families that are left out um, because of access, financial access. And that's something we've got to solve here in our industry. We're working on it as an organization. We're part of... Um, the Aspen Institute's project play with a bunch of large organizations that you know, you know, top 500 um, corporations that are finding ways to solve this issue so that every kid who has a desire to play and get that sport experience um, can get on the field. Uh, if, if they're on free and reduced lunch, our mantra is they should be on free and reduced play because they need to be able to get in and get this experience. So Jason, as other entrepreneurs, this has been great. As other entrepreneurs want to talk to you, learn from you, partner with you, grow with you, do whatever they want to do. How do they reach you? Yeah. Uh, emails, Jason at sport Uh, they can, you know, look at our website, sports is our company website. Uh, all of our contact information, uh, is there as well. Uh, I'm on Twitter at, at Clement Jason, um, you know, as well. Um, but would love for people to, to reach out and, uh, man, just, Love the entrepreneurial journey. I'm on the state of Florida here. I was um, I was uh, promoted by the governor and by the the speaker of the house to be on the small business economic development corporation for the state. Um, and small business growing into large business is the engine that um, that drives our economy and is and the and the innovation that comes with it is one of the things that makes our country um, so great. And what you talked about, phase one to phase two, phase three. Um, you know, and as a business owner, how do I diversify my investments? And, you know, my, my biggest investment is in our firm and in our business right now. But I do need to be looking at where I put the rest of my assets, you know, so that I, I'm, I'm, I'm planning things properly. And obviously, Elliot, that's what you do um, so, so well. So um, for, for those of us in the business community and what you're doing uh, to, you know, protect us, help us plan strategically and uh, take that off our shoulders so that we can focus on the things that grow our economy and our own businesses and serve our clients and customers really well. You know, I just want to say thank you. It's a really important service. Well, it's my pleasure. And I hope the next time we talk that we're both clients of each other. How's that? There we go. So this has been great. If you're a business owner, and that's why we did this, and you've got that aspiration to become a business owner, an entrepreneur, you understand that I want to grow something from an idea, from an acorn, into just a very large oak tree and take it forward, then uh, Meet the Expert with Elliot Callen is a great show. Jason's a great person I have a conversation with. If you want to reach him, and if you didn't get his credentials, it'll be in the show. But you can reach me at 
314-8503 or Elliot, E-L-L-I-O-T at Prosperity Financial Group. Have a great day, everybody. We'll see you again. So this has been one exciting episode and an entrepreneur's journey to having a really successful business based in Florida, but on national potential. And in most states, it's a sports facilities program where they bring economic vitality and they bring sports tourism, their facilities all around the country. They don't own them. They manage them. It's in the billions of billions of dollars of economic output and the tens of millions of people that are are seeing these facilities. But the best thing about the show was you, you watched an entrepreneur in phase two, which is really the growth phase, just show you how to take a company from an idea like a sports field. You might say, who needs them? Cities do that. To something that's amazing. Uh, again, as large as they are, and as in-depth they think about how to have the mental state of teens thrive with everything they're doing. Great show.